So I'm going to be talking today about America's declining trust in higher education and what we can do about it. And before I get started, you know, I, I want to convince you that this is a problem that everybody in this room should care about, not just because we are educators or students, but as citizens, because I think that this is a phenomenon uh, that impacts society more broadly. And so I want to begin by talking about a quote from Charlie Kirk. I don't know if you know who Charlie Kirk is. He's the founder of Turning Point USA. And at CPAC this year, a group of uh, conservative pundits go, uh, he said, do not give money to higher education. They, higher educators, are going to put that money directly to the destruction of Western civilization. Now, this is a pretty extreme statement, but it mirrors something that we see going on in the public more generally. So this was a study done by Pew uh, a couple of months ago in September, uh, and they looked at Democrats and Republicans' attitudes toward higher education as an institution. And what they noted is that from about 2015 onwards, Republicans, people who identify with the Republican Party, have become considerably more negative in their views toward higher education. Democrats and people who lean Democratic have pretty much stayed the same since 2010. And this got a ton of media coverage. I'm sure people in this room are familiar with the study saw some of the media coverage about it. But we had articles saying things like, why the war on college is justified? Why do so many Republicans hate college? Conservatives are souring on college. Blame colleges, right? This came as a surprise to many pundits in the, in the media. But I'm going to argue that it shouldn't have been. So I have three central goals that I want to accomplish with this talk today, and hopefully you can get it done in about 20 minutes. <laughs> the first is that I want to explore the scope and the pervasiveness of attitudes and negative attitudes toward higher education, but I'm going to do something different than what Pew and others have done. I don't want to look at colleges as institutions. I want to look at college professors and higher educators as people and see how those attitudes, uh, how, how those look. The next is that I want to consider why this is a problem. You know, why does it matter that people hold negative attitudes toward higher ed? I'm going to advance the argument that these attitudes have important social and political consequences. And finally, I want to review potential strategies by which these attitudes can be mitigated. What can everybody in this room do to improve America's faith in higher education as well as higher educators, the people doing the education? And I want to be really clear from the outset what I'm not trying to say in this talk. I'm not trying to say that skepticism towards scientists, experts, and academics more generally is never warranted. I mean, indeed, skepticism is kind of the foundation of what we all do here, right? Uh, I don't want to say that these opinions and that, you know, what educators say in the classroom ought to be accepted uncritically. And I also don't want to say that this is a purely Republican or conservative phenomenon. I'm going to dig through some data that I collected recently that shows that, in fact, while this is more common on the ideological right, there are people who believe some of the things we're going to talk about on the ideological left. And finally, I don't want to tell you that there's some kind of magic formula by which we can improve faith in higher ed, because there isn't. But I at least want to walk through peer-reviewed and tested strategies by which we can do it. So the first part of this talk is going to focus on the pervasive, partisan, and personal nature of negative attitudes toward higher education. And so to get at this, I fielded a survey in December 2017, a nationally representative survey, where we asked people questions not about colleges as institutions, but about college professors and the people who work at colleges. We asked people questions like this. You simply can't trust most college professors. We found that about 25% of Americans agreed, 27% uh, of Americans agreed with that statement. We asked them whether they thought most college professors were elitist and found that 31% agreed with that statement. And this one, <laughs> college professors enjoy telling ordinary people what to think and how they ought to live their lives. 40% of Americans endorsed this statement. So this is a pervasive, these negative attitudes toward higher educators, these are pretty pervasive in the American mass public. And I want to consider where they come from. Who agrees with these statements? And there's been a couple of factors that have been proposed as relevant in the scholarly literature. One is political ideology. I won't talk too much about this because we're going to be talking about it throughout the talk. But with statements from people like Charlie Kirk, it's pretty easy to see why there might be some link between conservatism, ideological conservatism, 
uh, and negative attitudes toward higher ed. And another is religiosity. The argument here in the literature being that people who are more religious are going to be more likely to defer to other sources of expertise, such as religious sources of expertise there, you know, priests and spiritual leaders. So these graphs chart the uh, proportion of people with different ideological self-identifications, ranging from the bluest bars, the most liberal, to the reddest bars, the most conservative, and the extent to which they agree with each of the statements I showed you on the previous slide. Right? So we find that about half of the most conservative people in America agree with the statement that you can't trust most college professors. But these attitudes aren't absent on the left. We find that about 40% of the most liberal people in our sample uh, believed this. We see a similar trend for the college professors are elitist question. Again, people who are more conservative are clearly more likely to endorse these attitudes. About 70% of the most conservative think that college professors are elitists. Uh, but we do see some resonance on the left of this idea. The most liberal uh, category here with about 35% endorsing this statement. And finally, college professors telling ordinary people what to think and how they ought to live their lives. We find close to 80% of the most conservative endorsing this statement. But again, not absent on the left with uh, about 45% endorsing it amongst the most liberal. So clearly there is some kind of relationship between political ideology and negative attitudes toward higher educators. More conservative people are going to be more likely to hold these attitudes, but they're not the only ones who hold them. We see a similar pattern for religiosity. The x-axis here uh, ranges from people who are not very active religiously to people who are very active religiously. Uh, and again, we find a clear pattern that people who are the most uh, active in their religious practice tend to be most likely to think that you can't trust most college professors. But I would again note that even on the very inactive side, there is still some number of people, about one-fifth, uh, who hold these attitudes. Pretty much the same pattern going on for elitism. About half of the most religious see college professors as elitist, about a fifth again for the least active. And again, the same pattern for telling people what to think and how they ought to live their lives. There's a clear relationship between both religiosity and ideological conservatism and negative attitudes toward higher ed. So what I want to talk about today is how did we get here? And the argument that I'm going to advance is that this is not a unique historical moment, that this has actually happened before. But in order to understand why that's true, I argue that theories that have been advanced in public opinion research about how people formulate political opinions can actually be quite useful in figuring out why they hold negative attitudes toward higher educators. So this is a graph from uh, John Zoller's famous 1992 book, The Nature and Origins of Mass Opinion, uh, in which he tracks liberals and conservative support for the Vietnam War in 1964 on the left and in 1970 on the right. In 1964, majority of both liberal and conservative leaning political elites as well as people in the media uh, were generally on board with the Vietnam War. And we didn't see much difference in opinion between liberals and conservatives, uh, even those who watched the news and were very attuned to politics. But in 1970, we see a pretty dramatic change. Amongst liberals who were very attentive to the news, who knew what political elites were saying, we see a pretty steep drop off in support for the Vietnam War, where conservatives tended to stay pretty much the same throughout the entire uh, series here. And the reason why this is useful is because elites have actually soured on higher education in the recent past in a pretty public way. Here's a quote from Rush Limbaugh from February 2016. This is about a year uh, and a half before that Pew study was done that I referenced earlier and about two years before mine. Uh, and he wrote that the, or he said on the radio, that the education system is where young skulls full of mush are programmed and propagandized into the system. Donald Trump Jr., son of uh, President Trump at a, at a college, said to a college audience that college professors will teach you how to pretend to be an anti-fascist and how to be an actual fascist. So what we saw here is this case where political elites on the right, right now, uh, have soured on higher ed. Uh, 
And Republicans in the public have seemed to have picked up on those uh, attitudes. This dynamic is not new. This has happened several times in American history, and I want to review uh, what some of those instances are. So Richard Hofstadter, in his Pulitzer Prize winning book, Anti-Intellectualism in American Life, uh, wrote about this topic extensively, documented several uh, historical examples, and I'm going to walk through a couple here. But just to get our terms straight, Richard Hofstadter identifies anti-intellectualism as a resentment and a suspicion of the life of the mind and all those who are considered to represent it. He talked about a couple of instances uh, in which we saw anti-intellectualism flare up in the public, beginning with the elites and eventually trickling down to the masses. In the 1828 presidential election, Andrew Jackson, this is Andrew Jackson, was pitted against John Quincy Adams, and an adage that his campaign threw around uh, was that Andrew Jackson could fight, but John Quincy Adams could only write. That campaign uh, slogan became a sticking point in the election of 1828, as Hofstadter details. In the 1968 presidential election, we see a similar pattern with George Wallace. This is George Wallace. Uh, he wasn't a major party candidate at the time, but he loved to deride college professors as these pointy-headed intellectuals who couldn't park a bicycle straight. That was one of his favorite talking points on the campaign trail in 1968, and it seemed to stick uh, with, with voters. And I'll say that I've done some research on the 1968 election using public opinion data to show that, in fact, people who believed these things were more likely to vote for George Wallace. Feel free to ask me more about that later. So I want to return to the Charlie Kirk quote that I used to begin this talk. This is an anonymous editorial from The Freeman, which was a libertarian-leaning magazine from the 1950s, uh, and the anonymous writer said that our universities are the training grounds for the barbarians of the future. This was quoted in Hofstadter's book. That reminds me quite a bit of this quote from Charlie Kirk. Do not give money to higher education. They're going to put that money directly to the destruction of Western civilization. This is a trend that we see happening at several moments in American history. And while I think that the, there are some unique aspects to what we're experiencing now, and I'm happy to talk about those more uh, later on, this is certainly not the only time it's happened. So to recap part one of this talk, I argue that many Americans hold negative attitudes toward higher education and higher educators. Uh, and these feelings are more common on the ideological right. And they're more common amongst people who are more religious. But I would note that they're not absent on the left. And they're not absent amongst people who are less religious. And finally, negative attitudes toward higher ed are not new. It's important to understand that what we see going on now is something that we've seen before. And the next part of this talk, I want to talk about why this matters. Sure, maybe many Americans hold negative attitudes toward higher ed, but why do we care? People in this room care because we are higher educators or we maybe want to be one day. Um, but I'm also going to argue that people who hold these attitudes tend to vote for political candidates who share their skepticism, who also hold negative attitudes toward higher ed. And that's a problem. That's a problem because elections have consequences, as we'll see. Some research from uh, Wendy Ron and Eric Oliver has shown that support for Donald Trump and other populist candidates tends to be correlated with the distrust of elites in general. And referencing the, and so that's, that's what this uh, arrow is pointing to here. This is the correlation between those two things. And using the questions I showed you earlier in this talk, I looked at the exact same thing, although I used some multivariate statistics, which I can talk about later, uh, to look at the effect of attitudes, negative attitudes toward educators on candidate support in the 2016 election. And indeed, people who held more negative attitudes toward higher ed and higher educators were significantly more likely to pick Donald Trump over Hillary Clinton in that contest. So the y-axis here is the probability of voting for Trump over Clinton, and the x-axis is how negative people were uh, toward higher educators. And the reason why this matters is that elections have consequences. We basically have this dynamic wherein political elites are saying some of the stuff, the Rush Limbaugh quote, the Charlie Kirk quote, uh, putting negative attitudes toward higher educators into public discourse People are picking up on it, and then they're voting for candidates who share 
those sympathies. And the reason why we care about this is because elections have consequences. I'm not going to review them all here, but I'll throw up several on the slides. The Trump presidency has had several, I would argue, adverse effects on uh, higher education in the US, including graduate student tuition, uh, tax hikes, proposed cuts to student financial aid, withholding funding from UC Berkeley, gag orders on environmental research. I mean, the list goes on. And if we care about these policy outcomes, then we ought to think about how the relationship uh, between people's negative attitudes toward higher ed shapes who they're voting for and what they end up doing when they're in office. So to recap what I told you in part two of this talk, people who hold negative attitudes toward higher ed are more likely to vote for candidates who feel the same way. And those candidates take action in line with, with those feelings. That means that uh, that has important policy consequences when those candidates are elected. If someone is elected to office because they know they have a constituency somewhere in the public uh, that distrusts higher education, then they're going to take action to try to represent those people in Washington, or they may take action to do that. And if that happens, we get the dynamic that I showed you on the previous slide. And so the final question I want to ask before wrapping up is what we can do about this. What can us in this room as educators or as students or as citizens do to combat this trend. And I'm going to review three strategies by which I think we can do this. These have been, uh, these largely draw on peer reviewed research, but like I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, this is not a magic bullet. There's no one formula by which you can improve trust in higher ed. So I'm going to review three strategies. The first is what I call the stay in your lane approach. The second is the appeal to share values approach. And the final is uh, the imperative to separate facts from feelings. And I'll explain what those all mean in a second. So first I'm going to talk about the stay in your lane approach. One problem that we have in higher education is that some people find experts unapproachable and unsympathetic to their values and concerns. My recommendations, and this is what the stay in your lane approach is, is that we ought not, as educators, to claim expertise that we don't have. We should not assert authority without justification, and we should always listen to what other people have to say. This is to say that we shouldn't shut people down by saying, I have a PhD in such and such a field, therefore you have to listen to me, which is something that <laughs> goes on, unfortunately, uh, quite a bit. And so Hofstadter actually, Richard Hofstadter, who I mentioned before, referenced this dynamic in his uh, book on anti-intellectualism. He called it the common touch. He wrote that in intellect in America is resented as a quality which almost certainly deprives a man or woman of the common touch. The ability to understand where people are coming from and give them information in a way that's digestible and understandable. And there's actually, you know, uh, maybe you're, you're, some of you are familiar with this, peer-reviewed research on this idea. Compared to regular people, this is a study from Root, Inns, and Heine in uh, 2016. It was published in Plaus. They found that scientists, not higher educators, they didn't ask that specifically, but I've shown in previous research that the two concepts are related to each other, uh, that scientists tend to be perceived as more robotic, more likely to lack emotions, and colder than ordinary people. This is the image problem I was talking about two slides ago, and what Hofstadter called the lacking the common touch. And I want to hammer home an example of where this went wrong by talking about sheep farming in the wake of Chernobyl. I'll uh, spare you most of the details, but the general idea is that after the Chernobyl accident, uh, sheep farmers in the northern UK were impacted by increasing rates of cesium in the soil. And so there was this big controversy, should the government step in and tell farmers how they ought to raise their sheep, whether they should slaughter the sheep, uh, and how generally to deal with radioactivity. And so Wynne, in 1992, wrote a comprehensive report of some of the interviews that he and his grad students had with farmers in the wake of the Chernobyl accident. And one of his farmers said the following, experts don't understand our way of life. I've never heard of a sheep that would even look at straw as fodder. The reason why this farmer said this is because the government in the UK came to farms in the northern UK 
and gave them instructions about how to deal with cesium increases in straw. The problem, maybe people in the Midwest or from the Midwest would know this, is that sheep don't eat straw. Right, so the government scientists came into farms in the northern UK, told them how they were supposed to deal with their livestock on the basis of recommendations about a food that their livestock don't even eat. And as Wynn details in the article, this could have simply been avoided if government scientists, when offering their recommendations, had actually visited a farm or even visited the region uh, and tried to do a better job understanding where farmers were coming from. And so the stay in your lane approach, again, is getting to this idea that it's incumbent on us as educators and as researchers to understand where people are coming from, to make an effort to reach out to them, uh, and not to assert expertise without reaching out and trying to understand. So the next approach is what I call appealing to shared values. The problem is that opinions about higher education and science have become partisan and religious and cultural battlegrounds. My recommendation is that we should make a conscious effort to understand why people don't accept scientific consensus and then identify solutions that can make both sides happy. So you don't have to interpret this graph. Basically, the large uh, slanted downward lines indicate a stronger correlation between political ideology and scientific consensus on a particular issue. So issues like global warming tend to be highly partisan and ideological, whereas nanotechnology doesn't tend to change much across uh, the partisan divide. And my argument is that it's incumbent on us as researchers and academics to know which issues are polarized and then identify strategies by which we can reach out to the other side of the aisle. So one way that we see this happening right now are from people who were previously uh, you know, anti-climate researchers taking a stance in favor of uh, scientific consensus on climate change using a free market approach. Someone like Jerry Taylor, who's the founder of the Nysaknin Center, uh, argued in an, in an interview, if you believe in free markets, how are free market ends advanced by burning the planet? Jerry Taylor is somebody who used to do research uh, for an institution, the Cato Institute, that is somewhat skeptical of climate change and has now made it the point of his career to try to convince people climate change is real and happening. I understand that conservatives and perhaps libertarians are less likely to agree with this, but use the language of conservatism to try to get them on board with scientific consensus, to say, if you believe in free markets, what's going to happen if the Earth is uh, burning? <laughs> and whether or not this actually works is an interesting question. I won't belabor this point too much. Um, but psychologically, we know that the way that people interpret new information, uh, generally speaking, is in line with their prior factual beliefs. People who uh, believe, let's say, people who agree uh, with what the Democrats have to say most of the time are going to interpret evidence in line with their prior political affiliation. So I'm going to be, if I'm a Democrat, less likely to accept that my side committed a scandal or some kind of, uh, you know, misdeed if, if, I, uh, if I already believe uh, you know, that side. Anyway, what we're trying to do here is use politically motivated reasoning, this psychological process, uh, recognize that it's happening, and then turn it on its head in order to then convince people to accept climate uh, and other types of scientific consensus. So if we know that one side is more likely to deny these things, we should use the values that they do hold and try to merge those with uh, scientific consensus to get them on board. And I'll be quick because I know I'm running out of time. Um, but the last step is to separate facts from feelings. One problem is that we as educators uh, and as people don't all interpret the facts in the same way. And my recommendations are that we shouldn't assume that people who disagree with scientific consensus and who disagree with their professors are stupid. They're not stupid. Um, my suggestion is that we embrace skepticism and walk through rational critiques of scientific and other skepticism. So here's a quick example. If we were to only look at the fourth quadrant here of this picture, we would see that people who are below average in religiosity 
are less likely to accept scientific consensus on evolution versus creationism. Whereas people who are, sorry, I should say above average. <laughs> and people who are below average are going to be more likely to accept it. If we only looked at this pain, we would think that people who are above average in religiosity just don't understand science. They don't understand that evolution is something that most scientists agree is the way that humans came to be. But if we were to take a broader picture and look at questions about non-politically polarized and non-religiously polarized issues, like electrons being smaller than atoms or the gaseous composition of the atmosphere, we'd find that the least and most religious people don't look all that different. And so what we see going on here is that people who generally have a good understanding of the facts in some domains have had those facts colored by feelings. And so my argument is that it's incumbent on us to know what those are and to then take strategies to correct it. One strategy that I find appealing is from Kemp. Uh, he wrote an article in 1988 where he argued that rather than refusing to discuss creationism in public schools, uh, rather than saying people who believe in creationism are stupid or don't understand science, we should instead use creationism as an opportunity to better understand evolution. We could use it as a foil for evolution and have people critically walk through the arguments that creationists typically make in order to understand their scientific uh, and other merits. And hopefully in doing that, you not only reinforce belief in scientific consensus, but also teach them a little bit about the process of collecting information scientifically. So really, really quick recap, because I know I'm out of time. <laughs> Four conclusions. The first is that negative attitudes toward higher educators are prevalent and personal. Many Americans hold these attitudes, and it's not just towards colleges and institutions, it's towards the people in them. The second is while these attitudes are salient and polarized now, they're not new. As I detailed from Hofstadter's book and some of these other examples, this is not a unique historical moment. It's one of many. Third is that elections have consequences. Negative attitudes toward higher educators make people who share those attitudes more likely to take office, and then they take action in line with those attitudes. Or if they do, it's a, it's a problem. And finally is that we can do better. Educators are not powerless. We can embrace some of the strategies that I mentioned before. We can embrace and develop new strategies. But we can communicate more effectively. We just have to be strategic. Thanks. Uh, so we went with a uh, survey sampling company, and we bought a sample from them. And then we yeah, just administered a short public opinion survey. How many people did you uh, The N on this one was like 1,500. Around the country? Yep. Yeah, so this was um, not formally nationally representative. It was quasi-representative. And then we applied some post-stratification techniques to make it representative. Oh, oh yeah. Oh. Yeah, we'll go with Sabrina first and then, yeah. Okay. Um, so what are your recommendations on staying the Yes. Okay. Um, the one where um, you said something about experts uh, don't claim to be an expert. Like yeah, like yeah. So what, what, in this case, what is the definition of an expert? That's such a good question. And that's something that, you know, every time I talk about this comes up. Because, I mean, somebody who is a master violinist is an expert, right, at playing the violin. Um, I'm talking specifically in this case about higher educators uh, as being a form of expert, but it's a, it's a slippery concept. My argument would be that you need to make an a priori decision, who is the expert here, before formulating a research question, before fo formulating policy recommendations, for example, but having a clear definition of what that is, because people do tend to throw around the term without defining it first. Maybe I'll pass because it's okay. a complicated discussion to get on to the next. Oh, sure. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that in peer uh, review literature, most of the um, 
pattern around attitudes was on ideology mm -hmm. and religion. Yeah. Um, was that, were there any that you saw besides religion and ideology sure. that would kind of like yeah. you know, create an opening um, from those charged? Well, for me, I think that's a really great question. And for me, one of the very interesting things are the things that don't do this, the things that don't polarize. Usually when I present research like this, people ask me, well, what about people with advanced degrees? Certainly they have different attitudes. And yeah, they do to some degree. They're, they're somewhat more positive uh, toward higher education than people who don't. But actually, education doesn't play all that much of a role, which is something that's interesting. Um, but yeah, we've certainly examined other things uh, other than just ideology and religion. Uh, but those seem to be the, the major factors, in my view. Yeah, thank you.